In this video, we're going to talk about some different ways we can convert an alkene into an epoxide. So let's say if we have this particular alkene, let's start with cyclohexene. What reagent do we need in order to convert it to an epoxide? Perhaps you've seen this in your organic chemistry textbook, RCO3H. That's the functional group of a peroxy acid. A peroxy acid is, it looks like a carboxylic acid, but it has a peroxide group as well. So like a carboxylic acid, it has the carbonyl functional group, but it also has a peroxide instead of a hydroxyl group. A hydroxyl group is an OH. A peroxy group or peroxide group has two oxygens connected by means of a single bond. So a peroxy acid looks like this. Proxy acids are very useful in making uh, epoxides from alkenes. Now there's another specific proxy acid that you need to be familiar with, MCPBA. If you see that, it works just the same way as RCO3H. And basically, it's a benzene ring with a proxy acid functional group and a chlorine atom attached to it on a meta position. So it's called metachloral peroxy benzoic acid. When we combine it with an alkene, it's going to produce an epoxide. And the epoxide looks like this. But now how can we draw a mechanism for this reaction. How does the alkene actually convert into the epoxide? Well, let's find out. Let's start with uh, cyclohexene again. And we're going to draw the proxy acid a certain way relative to the cyclohexene. This reaction is basically a concerted reaction mechanism. Everything happens all at once. Every bond forming and bond breaking process occurs simultaneously. So now the first thing that's going to happen is the double bond is going to attack the oxygen. And notice where I put the arrow. The two electrons in the pi bond are going to be used to create a bond between the carbon and the oxygen. And then the electrons that connect the oxygen and the hydrogen, those electrons are going to be used to create another bond between this carbon and this oxygen. So I'm going to color code it. And at the same time, this bond is going to break. Those electrons will be used to form a double bond. And the pi bond of the carbonyl group is going to break. And it's going to be used to create a bond between the oxygen, this oxygen, and this hydrogen. So here's the oxygen that's going to be part of the epoxide. Here's the red bond, which came from the pi electrons of the alkene. Here's the yellow bond, which came from the single bond between oxygen and hydrogen. And then we have a carbon, an R group, an oxygen, and another oxygen. Notice that this is going to be a double bond. So I'm going to put a green double bond here, which came from these electrons. And then there's going to be attachment between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Those electrons came from this bond, which is now a single bond. So as you can see, the peroxy acid basically transferred one of its oxygens to the alkene, converting the alkene into an epoxide. And as the peroxy acid lost an oxygen, it has now been converted into a carboxylic acid. And so that's the mechanism for the reaction. It turns out that the peroxy acid pathway is not the only way to convert an alkene into an epoxide. 
what we can use is the halohydrin reaction. So starting with cyclohexene, if we add bromine in water, this is going to give us the halohydrin product. It's an anti-addition reaction. And typically, the OH group will go on a more substituted carbon of the double bond. But because these two carbons are the same, it really doesn't matter where you put the OH and BR with respect to each other. Now, you do also get the enantiomer. Now, once you add sodium hydroxide to the halohydrin uh, product, it's going to convert into the epoxide. And so that's another way to get it. But let's go over the mechanism for this process. So how will the alkene react with Br2? So the first thing that happens, the double bond attacks the bromine atom, expelling the other bromine atom, and this bromine simultaneously attacks the double bond. And so what we're going to get is a cyclic Brominium intermediate. Initially, bromine has three lone pairs, but now it lost one to form a, a bond with a double bond. And so now it has a plus charge. Now keep in mind, we still have water in the solution. Water is going to attack the carbon atom from the backside. The carbon that is attached to the bromine atom has a partial positive charge. The oxygen in water has a partial negative charge. So oxygen is electrostatically attracted to the carbon atom with a partial positive charge. As a result, it's going to attack it from the back, causing this bond to open. And so that's why you're going to get an oxygen on one carbon and a bromine on the other. And you can see why it's anti. The water attacks the carbon from the back, pushing this bromine away towards the front. Let's put this in the back. But right now, oxygen has a plus charge. Whenever oxygen has three bonds, it will always have a plus charge. And so we need to remove that hydrogen. Any hydrogen attached to an oxygen with a plus charge is a very acidic hydrogen. So water is going to act as a weak base. It's going to abstract a proton. And now we have our halohydrin product. Now it doesn't end there. So once we have the halohydrin product, we can react it with sodium hydroxide. The sodium ion is basically a spectated ion. It watches, but it really doesn't participate in the reaction. So let's focus on the hydroxide ion. The hydroxide ion is a strong base, and as a result, it's going to abstract the proton from the alcohol. And it's going to put a negative charge on the oxygen. An oxygen with a negative charge attached to a carbon is typically called an alkoxide ion. And it's also a good nucleophile. This oxygen will attack a carbon since that carbon has a partial positive charge and the oxygen is very close to it. It's going to attack it and then it's going to kick out the bromine atom. And so that's how the epoxide is going to form under basic conditions. So now you have two ways in in order to make uh, an epoxide from an alkene. And you can use a peroxy acid, which will happen in one step, or you can use the halohydrin reaction, followed by the addition of a base to remove the halogen. Now, once we have the epoxide, what's going to happen if we add H2O plus to it? What do you think is going to happen? Well, this reaction is going to produce two diols, anti-addition. So one is going to be in the front, the other is going to be in the back. And plus, you're going to get the other stereoisomer, that is the enantiomer. So this reaction is stereoselective. We're going to get the anti-addition product as opposed to the syn-addition product.
but let's talk about the mechanism for this process. So we know the oxygen has a partial negative charge and it's attracted to the partial positive charge that's on the hydrogen. So this is the hydronium ion. It's going to protonate the epoxide. So once the oxygen of the epoxide grabs a hydrogen, it turns into a good leaving group. It's going to be easy to break the carbon-oxygen bond. So now that H3O plus has lost a hydrogen, it's now neutral. It's now in the form of water. So the oxygen in water is attracted to the partially positive carbon atom that is attached to the epoxide. So this oxygen attacks the carbon from the back, pushing the OH group to the front. So we have the water molecule on the back. And the OH group in the front, we can see why it's an anti-addition reaction. But this oxygen has a positive charge, which means we need to use another water molecule to get rid of that hydrogen. And this gives us our final product, which is two dials trans respective to each other.